Well, Merry Christmas, Liquid Church. Hey, let's send some Christmas love to Church Online, all our live locations. So glad you guys are with us. Hey, hey, I got a special guest with us, Nick Damari from Rise Against Hunger. What's up, my man? How we doing? What's up, Liquid? Guys, you guys know Rise Against Hunger is our outreach partner. They help lead this weekend's Christmas outreach to pack meals for hungry kids and hurting families in the Philippines. Philippines were hit by severe weather, devastated their farmland, their infrastructure. So families there are struggling with food insecurity. And this Christmas, you stepped up to feed them. Nick, tell us, how did we do this weekend? Yeah, that's right, Tim. The outreach was incredible, all right? We were blown away by the amazing volunteers here at Liquid Church. We had thousands of volunteers working in five different locations around New Jersey, packaging healthy meals for the hungry families in the Philippines. And Rise Against Hunger is shipping those meals directly to the Philippines this coming week to make an immediate need. All right, guys, you want to know the total? Let me get a little drum roll. Come on, everybody, drum roll. Here we go. Guys, the total is you packed over one million meals in a single weekend. I am so proud of you for feeding the hungry in Jesus' name. Nick, we share your passion for ending the epidemic of food insecurity, chronic malnutrition, really all around the world. And so our church, we just feel so humbled to be able to invest our money, our manpower to help fight world hunger this Christmas. Yeah, Pastor Tim, we are so grateful uh, for the partnership here with Liquid. If you serve with us this weekend, now you know that we do something fun at Rise Against Hunger. At each and every one of our locations, we have a brass gong here that we <laughs> ring as a meal packing milestone. I remember. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so today, Pastor Tim, we brought your very own gong back here to be able to commemorate the one million meals we were able to package for the Philippines. So fun. All right, so we're gonna ring the gong here. This is like the gong show, all right? Give me a three, two, one. Here we go. Three, two, one. Whoa! Come on, man, dude. Amazing, amazing to partner together, guys. That's two years in a row, over a million meals. We love serving Jesus and serving the poor with you. Can we thank our ministry partners at Rise Against Hunger again, man? Grateful for you, Nick, for the whole team, man. Just so grateful. These guys are incredible partners. Guys, I'm, I'm so proud that you invested your time this weekend as kind of the Christmas season starts, you put on hairnets and helping the hungry. But I want everyone to know, um, you can still be part of this outreach. If you, if you miss serving, you may wonder like, well, how are they paying for 1 million meals? And the answer is through our year end Christmas offering. Um, at our locations today, you received a Christmas offering brochure. We'll put a link into the chat for Church Online. It's got all the details for you. Um, last weekend, as part of Vision Sunday, I shared that in the new year, God is calling us as a church to help the hurting in four ways. We're feeding the hungry, we're bringing clean water to the thirsty, and we're investing in marriages, men, and millennials at our church, and really expanding our digital discipleship. Now, the million meals that we just packed are 100% paid for, by this year's Christmas offering. So this December, if I can challenge you, as you give a gift that's above and beyond your normal tithe at year's end, you're literally filling empty stomachs of hungry kids on the other side of the world. So understand, when you give to our church, you're actually giving through our church to help the poor. Now, if you're new to Liquid, you gotta know this, man. We don't just go to church here. We are the church, amen? Amen? It takes generous donations of every size to pack and pay for a million meals. So thanks for your generosity this Christmas. Speaking of which, today we are kicking off our brand new Christmas series. It's called All I Want for Christmas. You know, at Christmas, right? I don't know about you, but in our you know, house, you know, the kids would always make lists of things we want. It's like, okay, I want, you know, new sneakers, new kicks. I want le Lululemon leggings. Uh, or I want that cool Yeti mug, whatever the thing is. What do you want for Christmas? Turn to your neighbor, tell them one thing. Type it in the chat. One thing you want for Christmas. Type it in right now, okay? Now, here's my fun little challenge. What if this Christmas we flip the script and ask, at Christmas, what does God want from us? I mean, at the end of the day, if you think about Christmas, Christmas is really Jesus' birthday party, isn't it? Like, like shouldn't, shouldn't he be the one kind of getting gifts? If, we, if God were to ask, you know, well, here's what I want for Christmas, what would he answer? Well, in Micah 6, 8, he answers that question. It says this, what does the Lord require of you? And he answers, do what? Read it with me, church. Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. God says, I got three things on my list. If you want to know what will actually bring joy to my heart this Christmas, it's actually pretty simple. I want you to do justice. I want you to love mercy. And I want you to walk 
proudly. No, walk humbly with me. Three pretty great gifts, right? Like when we look right now at our broken world, I think you agree. We see poor and oppressed people crying out for justice. We've seen that through this whole year. There is like a drought right now of mercy and kindness. And there is a desperate need for humility as we bring the love of Jesus to hurting people. So the question is this, what if Christmas wasn't about getting more stuff for us, but about actually giving more of ourselves to those who need it most? Well, this Christmas, we're going to drill down on what Jesus really wants for his birthday based on that, that verse, Micah 6, 8, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with God. And so this week, I'm going to talk to you and I'm going to teach you about what it means to do justice. What's that look like in the real world? Next week, we're talking about loving mercy. And then week three, how you can walk humbly with God this December in a world that's so proud and broken. And then we'll celebrate Christmas Eve together on Saturday, the 24th. So let's jump in and talk today about what it really means to do Justice. Everyone say justice. Justice is a term that's easily misunderstood, right? Especially in today's cultural climate. Like, are you talking, Tim, about like legal justice, like the court system? Or are, do you mean like social justice where we redistribute wealth and resources? No, 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 no. Today, I want to teach you from the word of God about biblical justice. Because the theme of justice runs from the opening pages of scripture to the very end. We see the justice of God on clear display to a broken world where so many people lack the basics. So if you have a Bible, you can flip open to the Old Testament prophet Isaiah chapter 58, which gives this absolutely beautiful, but let me warn you, shocking description of justice from God's eyes. And let me tell you what we're going to learn. I'm going to tell you in advance, okay? If you really want to do justice this December, it's going to require three things from you. Doing justice requires a relationship. It's impossible for you to have a relationship with God if you don't have a relationship with the poor. It requires a responsibility to actually show God's special care for the vulnerable and oppressed and resources. Our faith has resources that should inspire us to what Tim Keller calls a generous justice. So justice requires three things, a relationship, a responsibility, and resources to be generous with. All right, you ready? I'll show you why. Read with me Isaiah 58, first nine verses. It says this, shout it aloud. Everyone shout. Woo, here we go. Don't hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Here we go. Declare to my people their rebellion <laughs> and to descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day, they seek me out. They, they seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what's right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for, say it together, what kind of decisions? Just decisions. They seem eager for God to come near them. Why have they, we fasted, they say, and you haven't seen it. Why have we humbled ourselves and you haven't noticed? Hit pause. So God is talking to a group of people very much like you, who are churchgoers, even say they're religious. He says in verse two, for day after day, they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways. In other words, these are Jewish people who are going to the temple. That's what it means to seek God then. They prayed, they fasted, they read the Torah. They're sincere seekers of God. They want to genuinely know him. They're seeking him out day after day. So understand who this isn't. God's not talking to casual Christians here who attend church once or twice a year. These are faithful churchgoers or temple goers. And not only that, notice they're moral and ethical people. It says, as if they were a nation that does what is right, hasn't forsaken the commands of God. They ask me for just decisions. They seem eager for God to come near. So understand God's talking to good people. He's talking to church people. He's talking to moral, ethical people who are passionate they pray, they fast, they read their Bible. They really want to know God. They want to do the right thing. But here's the shocking part. God says to Isaiah, shout it aloud. Don't hold back. Declare to my people their rebellion. <laughs> Record scratch. Their sins. Wait, 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 wait. What? We're doing all this good stuff. Why is God calling us rebels? We're righteous. The people are shocked. So they ask in verse three, it says, God, why have we fasted and you haven't seen it? Well, we've been humbling ourselves and you haven't even noticed. God, why are you ignoring us? God, why are you angry with us? You ever feel that way? God, why aren't you answering my prayers? I'm doing everything right, aren't we? And God shakes his head. He's like, not exactly. What's God's complaint? Next verse. 
Yet on the day of your fasting, he says, you do as you please and you exploit all your workers. Injustice from the business owners. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife. You've got conflict and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Verse five, God says, is this not the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to hum themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is, is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? So God's having, he's taking them to the woodshed a little bit. He's actually challenging his people's notions of, of what religion and morality is. God's like, hey, I, um, I see that you guys go to church. Good for you. I see that you read your Bible in the morning. Good for you. I see that you pray, you have silence and stillness, and, and you fast, you deny your flesh, but you're still missing something pretty vital. And this is the beautiful part. Look at verse six. The Lord says, is this not the kind of fasting I, God, have chosen? To Let's read this together. To loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, and to set the oppressed, what? Free and break every yoke. He says, is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not turn away from your own flesh and blood. And this is shocking because God says, you think you're doing everything right, but the reality is you're lacking something vital. You don't have a relationship with the poor. Now, I'm going to state this in a very provocative way. You're some of you are going to maybe argue with me and send me nasty emails, but the reality is, you know what Isaiah is saying? You can't have a relationship with God if you don't have a relationship with the poor, with the hungry, with the homeless, with the naked, with the forgotten. Did you forget about them? God says, I want you, Christian, to join me and help loose the chains of injustice. I want to Set the oppressed free. I want you to share your food. What I gave you, share it with the hungry and provide the poor wanderer with shelter. And God says, you do this and oh, I promise you, I swear by myself, then your light will break forth like the dawn. Your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you. And this is, this is just like the coolest phrase. Look at this one. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. What's God saying? Translation. If you got the back of the poor, then God says, I got your back. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, God's got my back. God's got my back. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. Wow. <laughs> like what a, what a powerful promise and challenge from God to his people. God says, you want to have a relationship with me? And you go through all this religious activity, but you don't take time to have a relationship with the poor, with the homeless, with the hurting, the hungry. God's like, you don't really know me at all. See, according to Isaiah, as a Christian, you can't have a relationship with God if you don't have a relationship with the poor. Kind of shocking, isn't it? Now, why would God say that? Well, Proverbs 14, 31 makes this statement. It says this, those who oppress the poor actually insult their maker but helping the poor honors him. I want you to think about this. God says, if you insult the poor, you insult me. You ignore the poor, you're ignoring me. Conversely, if you're kind to the poor, ooh, that's like being kind to me. Look at Proverbs 19 says, whoever is kind to the poor, it's like lending to the Lord and he'll reward them for what they have done. What's the point? If you're new to Christianity, understand something. The God of the Christian Bible, the scriptures, is unlike every other deity in all world religions because our God identifies directly with the poor and the vulnerable. Not with those at the top of the ladder, not with the rich, not with the powerful, not with the wealthy, no. God says, I identify with those at the very bottom, the poor, the oppressed, the vulnerable. I identify, God says, with those who lack food, shelter, clothes, medical care, in a word, justice. 
Like if I said, who do you identify with? Like, how do you identify yourself? Uh, for me, like on, on my social media's accounts, you probably have this too, right? You got to complete a profile. Like you got to give like a few words that describe who you are. And you know what I have on my Instagram account? I actually put three words. It says, Tim Lucas, husband, father, and pastor. You know why? Those are the three most important relationships in my life. I define myself by identifying as a husband to Colleen. Like you mess with her, you mess with me. <laughs> if you identify with, with, with Chase and Dell, I'm their father. You mess with my kids, you're going to mess with me. <laughs> and I'm your pastor. You mess with the sheep, you're going to get a bull by the horns. Those are my three relationships. I'm like husband, father, pastor. Do you know how God identifies himself in his account, the Bible? God says, I am a father to the fatherless. I'm a husband to the widow. I am a defender to the poor. You mess with them, you're messing with me. He identifies directly with the poor and the vulnerable. He says, they are my priority relationships. Now, I want you to understand how radical this is. Historians will tell you there is no other God in all of ancient antiquity who identified with the poor and oppressed. It was just the opposite. Ancient gods always identified with kings, generals, and the rich. People who had gotten to the top because it was assumed, hey, if you have wealth, you got power, you got prestige, God's probably blessing you. That's why you have riches and respect. But the Christian God's like, ah, uh -uh, I don't play like that. I'm not in bed with the rich and the powerful. God says, I identify one-on-one -on -one with the poor and the vulnerable. They actually get the prime cut of my heart first. Listen to Zechariah chapter seven. It says this. This is what the Lord Almighty said. Administer true what? Justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. And here it is. Do not oppress who? Read it with me. The widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Guys, this is the Old Testament. All anybody knows here is that there is a patriarchal, male-dominated culture. And God says, I stand with the widow. What? A poor, powerless woman. In a culture that values family name and your bloodlines matter above everything else. God says, I stand with the fatherless, with orphans. In a tribal culture where you swore loyalty to your nation, God says, I stand with the foreigner or the immigrant, a person of a different race or nationality. In a consumer culture that believed to be rich was to be blessed, God says, I stand with the poor. Over and over, God says, if you think you can have a relationship with me and ignore the people I identify with, you are mistaken. You cannot have a relationship with God if you don't have a relationship with the poor. So can I ask you this? Can I ask you a question? Ready? Here it is. Do you? Do you actually have a relationship with the poor? Now, notice I didn't ask, hey, do you uh, once in a while show a little charity? you know, <laughs> to help the poor, but do you actually have a relationship with them? Like, do you know the names? Here's a good question. Do you know the names of anybody who even fits these categories? What their hopes and dreams are? Where they hurt or where they struggle with on a street level? I'm sad to say, I remember in my 20s, one of my first jobs out of college was in New York City, and I would actually commute in on the train. And when my train would pull into Penn Station, as I walked up the steps in the winter, I'd have to step over dozens of homeless people who were huddled over the storm grates blowing hot air to keep warm. They'd be sleeping or laying there. And as the commuters came up, we would actually have to step over or, oh gosh, okay, go around to avoid the homeless poor. Now I was in my 20s. Once in a while, if I was feeling charitable, I'd drop a little change in their cup. But it, like, it didn't even occur to me to like, take time to ask their name or consider a relationship like a what? Like let alone a friendship with them. You know why? One of the reasons I was spiritually immature. I was a kid. I didn't really understand that one of the ways to know God's heart more deeply is to get to know some of his favorite people. People like Diego, Maria, and other friends who I met in the streets of Patterson last month. A few Fridays ago, Colleen and I had some friends from um, our Passaic County campus. We had the privilege of going out together on the relief bus. Or for those of you who don't know, City Relief, wonderful partners with Liquid Church. We drive retrofitted buses that are kind of like mobile rescue mission centers. 
And as followers of Jesus, what we do is we go out in the city streets to feed and clothe our homeless friends. Friends like Michelle. I'll show you a picture. Michelle was in pretty rough shape when we talked. She was hunched over. You could see she could barely stand. And she had chronic back pain. Did not help sleeping on cement every night. And she groaned out to me. She said, Tim, I'm, I'm just tired. I said, what are you tired of, Michelle? She said, living on these streets. And her eyes had that dull, lifeless look. Now, Michelle was probably high, an addict, no doubt. She kept kind of coughing as we talked. And so Colleen and I gave her a, a cup of hot soup. And, and as she slurped her soup, she shared her story. Her ex-husband was an addict. Dyphus took away their daughter. She was living in another city. And Michelle said, living on these streets destroyed my health. She said, sleep on a cold pavement at night. She goes, I got damaged discs in my neck. My knees hurt. And she goes, I got a long walk to the shelter. And we always try to help people get into the shelters in Patterson. And I said, isn't it just up the streets? And she said, oh yeah, but I have to take the long way to avoid the gangs. And Michelle told me how she had been beat up four times, robbed, abused on the streets. So she's hyper vigilant, which is exhausting. I mean, imagine, imagine if you didn't know where you're going to sleep tonight. Yeah. Or like where your next meal would come from or who's coming after you. So we took some time just to love on Michelle and pray with her and gave her and, and our new friends some, some hot soup and some, some good bread. That's one of the best things we do with City Relief. We gave her free Bomba socks, new socks. You know what a gift that is in the cold days? Shirts, fresh shirts. And most importantly, it wasn't just soup. We gave her hope. Our group took time to remind her that God loves her and that he's always with her. And he sent us to remind her of that. And then Michelle kind of shuffled off into the night to the shelter down the street. Why would you spend your Friday night on the streets of Patterson sharing food and so giving out socks and just loving on strangers? And the answer is this, because I want to know the heart of God deeper. And now that I'm not in my twenties, I'm older. I've discovered a secret. You can't have a deep relationship with God if you don't have a substantial relationship with the poor. In some mysterious way, Jesus says, although I'm king of the world, with all the power and riches of the universe at my disposal, I identify with Michelle. That's my daughter. That's my girl. What kind of a faith have I called you to? God says, is it not to share your food with the hungry? to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe her and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. And guys, that's one of our goals of our church. We want to help you have a relationship with the poor so that you can experience the heart of God more deeply. Now, one way we do that is through our partnership with City Relief, which runs the relief bus. We have been partnering together for over 15 years now, feeding our homeless brothers and sisters on the city streets of Newark and now Patterson. And in 2023, we're actually expanding our partnership. This December, as a church, we are committing $100,000 to help homeless neighbors like Michelle living on the city streets of Patterson. I, have, I hope you have a chance to do it next year. Our, our group meets at the Passaic County campus in Wayne to ride the bus just 20 minutes away in Patterson. I'm going to show you a little bit of footage here. We, we took some of an iPhone video. Did you know Patterson, New Jersey has a poverty rate that is double that of New York City. We go to Wayne, but it's only 20 minutes away. It's literally right next door. And so we set the bus up on a street corner by Eva's Kitchen, right in the heart of Patterson, where people line up to receive hot soup, <laughs> new clothes, blankets, whatever they need. The relief bus has a mantra. They say, hey, we give out soup, socks, and Jesus. And you know what we do? We build relationship. As we interface with our homeless friends, we connect them to a continuum of care, drug treatment, reliable shelter, employment counseling, and we get to know each other's names. Oh, that's Diego. That's Maria. That's Michelle. And then we actually just pray with them and love on people like Jesus would. And it is so powerful. I pray that in 2023, many of you will invest your time to serve with City Relief in Patterson. As a church, we're making a major investment in this ministry this Christmas. And here's the deal. It ain't because we're good people. It's because we're God's people. Amen? God's their father. And you can't have a relationship with him if you don't have a relationship with them. Remember, doing justice requires a relationship with God and his favorite people, the poor. Do you have one?
I hope you will. Now, the second thing biblical justice requires is not just a relationship, but it's taking responsibility to be generous towards those in need. Um, Tim Keller wrote a fantastic book that's impacted me. It's called Generous Justice, How God's Grace, His Love, Makes Us Just. I highly recommend it. It's taught me a lot. And Keller notes that there are three basic responsibilities of justice. It, it really, on a most basic level, justice means you're responsible to treat all people equally. Everyone say equally. Regardless of their race, their sex, their nationality, their socioeconomic situation, justice just means everyone gets equal access to the same resources, education, medical care opportunities. And you may be like, well, where does that say that in the Bible? Go back to Isaiah. God says, I want you to loose the chains of injustice. Now, what does that mean? He says, well, here it is. It's to share your food with the hungry and provide the poor wanderer with shelter. When you see the naked, to clothe them and don't turn away from your own flesh and blood. If you circle that word wanderer, yeah, what's a wanderer? You're probably thinking of like a traveler, a nomad, someone wandering around. Not the best translation. The word wanderer here is the same word for alien. Everyone say alien. Not like do-do-do-do-do alien, like immigrant. Think like a refugee who's new to America. A migrant who gets shipped up here from Florida. <laughs> and is left out on the streets. And the question is, how should we treat them? And God says, I want you to share your food. I want you to clothe them. And watch this. He says, don't turn away from your own what? Flesh and blood. This is your brother or sister. Again, this is so radical. In a tribal world where blood and nation meant everything. You're in my clan. You're in my country. God had the audacity to say, every other human being is your own flesh and blood. Even if they're from a different culture, a different country, a different race, a different religion. God says, they're made in my image. And I want you to treat all people equally. That is the foundational principle of doing justice. You say, well, that's an American value, right? Where do you think we got the idea from? <laughs> it's the Bible, but it's more than that. God says, I want you to treat everyone equally, but I have one exception to the rule. I want you to have special care and concern for the poor. I don't want you to treat them equally. I want you to go above and beyond. Now, when the Bible talks about the poor, it's talking about people in our society who are most vulnerable. In Bible times, you know, it's widows and orphans, widowed women, not men, because they had no power. It was orphans, not sons, because they had no inheritance. But who is that in our day? It's the inner city kid, growing up without a father, a chaotic home life. It's the teenager in a failing school system who can't read, probably doesn't have a shot at college or a decent job. It's the single mom making minimum wage, trying to raise a couple kids and clean houses on the side. It's the military veteran who comes back home traumatized and is now out on the streets addicted to alcohol or pills and can't break the cycle. And God says, I want you to treat all people equally with one exception. I want you to have special care and concern for the vulnerable. Why? Because they need extra help and you're in a position to give it. Again, look at Proverbs 19. It says, whoever is kind to the poor lends to who? the Lord, and he'll reward them for what they've done. Don't miss this. God says, when you share your assets, you share your time, your money, your resources with the poor, whoever is kind to the poor, it's like you're literally giving a loan to God. Then he says, I'm going to pay it back in full and then some, which leads to the third responsibility. Doing justice means you actually practice generosity. Everyone say generosity. You open your hands and you share a portion of the resources that God's given you with people who need it more. Isaiah says, share your food, share your clothes, share your home. But then he goes further. In verse 10, he says, spend who? Yourselves on behalf of the hungry. Now understand, spend yourself. That means it's, he's not talking about token charity at Christmas. But this radical generosity of spirit that demands your whole life all year round. See, true justice culminates in radical generosity. Guys, that's why our church is investing 100 grand to help our homeless friends in 2023. And that's a lot of money. We're literally spending ourselves on behalf of the hungry, spending ourselves on behalf of the homeless in our cities. And that is more vital than ever as winter sets in and life on the streets gets dangerous. Take a look at the CBS News report. 
Well, the bitter cold this weekend could be dangerous for people experiencing homelessness. CBS News' Nick Calloway followed a group that's trying to get people indoors. As the temperature goes down, the most vulnerable are covering up. Yep, today is very cold. Sooner or later, they're going to find somebody out here frozen to death. Outside Newark Penn Station on this cold night, people in need come to get a hot meal. Rice and beans, tomatoes. But soup is just the beginning. B.J. Neal is an outreach leader with City Relief. So that we have an opportunity to take our friends that are out here on the streets to give them food, to give them something to drink, uh, to give them the, the resources that we bring, whether it's socks, masks. Uh, tonight we even have gloves and hats and things of that nature for people to keep warm. Because of the extreme cold, volunteers are also giving out sleeping bags and blankets. Last night I ain't had nothing, so I was just basically walking around <laughs> trying to stay warm. But tonight this would make a difference. The sleeping bags and food are nice, but the goal here is to get people experiencing homelessness off the streets for good. So outreach teams offer counseling and help getting into housing or a shelter or on frigid nights like this, even a hotel. You know, no amount of bundling up is going to protect you from a cold like that. You need to be indoors. Spencer Holmesborg has been volunteering with City Relief for about a decade, helping those in need get the help they need. I've seen a man get a new wheelchair, seen people, you give a man a soup and their face lights up, you listen to their story and you see the humanity in them. It really fills you with such grace. City Relief is handing out food here in Newark every Friday night. Tonight they were also able to get two people out of the cold and into a hotel for the weekend. In Newark, Nick Calloway, CBS 2 News. Church, make some noise if you're ready to do justice. This year, guys, type justice in the chat. I hope many of you will spend yourself serving the poor this December. We got a big goal, guys. Our Christmas offering is $500,000. But understand, when you give to our church, you're giving through our church to ministries like City Relief, which leads us to the last aspect of biblical justice. Remember what we learned today. You're going home in a few minutes. Doing justice requires a relationship with the poor. You have to take responsibility and actually practice generosity. And God, here's the deal, gives you the resources to do that. Some of us are like, well, now here we go. You know, this is where the pastor is going to ask for money. He kind of, you know, guilted us at Christmas and asked us for money. No, 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 no. I know. So you're like, well, isn't that the job of a pastor? No. <laughs> First off, guilt's a terrible motivator, isn't it? Here's the good news. Your faith, the Christian gospel has the resources to inspire a generosity and justice that comes out of the heart. We do not do guilt here at Liquid. We preach grace. Everyone say grace. Grace is the best news in the world. It is God's radical, over-the-top love and blessing of people who don't deserve it. And here's the good news. In the Old Testament, God identified with the poor. Turn the page. In the New Testament, God became one. That's why we celebrate Christmas. 700 years after the prophet Isaiah wrote the words we just read, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, visited earth, and he didn't arrive in a chariot. He wasn't born in a palace. He didn't sit on a throne. Instead, the king of the universe was born in a feed trough for barnyard animals. Jesus was born outside in the freezing cold in the squalor of a pig pen. When Jesus' parents had him circumcised the temple, do you know what they did? They gave two pigeons because that was the offering that only the poorest of the poor could afford. During his 33 years on earth, Jesus never owned a home. He actually said, you know, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. I want you to think about that. Jesus was homeless. And when he came to the end of his life, Jesus had to ride into Jerusalem on a borrowed donkey because he didn't own one. He had to eat in a borrowed room. And on the cross, he was stripped naked of his only possession, which was his robe. They cast lots for it. And then he was buried in a borrowed grave because he couldn't afford a funeral. In other words, Jesus didn't ident just identify with the poor. At Christmas, God literally became one. Why? To save you out of love for you. The Apostle Paul describes the incarnation this way. Let's read this out loud together, church. Big, loud voice. He says, you know the what? generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, here we go, ready? Yet for your sakes, he became what? Poor, 
so that by his poverty, he could make you rich. It's the grace of God, this radical, extravagant, over-the-top sacrifice on the cross that rescued you and me. So yes, you may be sitting here, maybe you're comfortable middle class, you may not be materially poor, but we're all poor in a spiritual sense, aren't we? Right? Like in God's eyes, we're all orphans. We're with, we don't have a place in his family. We're spiritually homeless. I mean, on your own, you can't even afford a home in heaven. Take all your best religious deeds, and the Bible says it's like filthy rags. You're gonna stand before God naked. So you may dress for success here on earth, but in God's eyes, he's like, you're a spiritual beggar. You've got nothing to offer me. And he says, yet I saw you in your broke down state. And instead of stepping over you, God stepped into the human condition and became one of us at Christmas. The one who had unlimited power and privilege became poor, homeless, and he gave up everything. If you think about it, in this life, Jesus didn't get justice, did he? He didn't. On the cross, he got the opposite. He got injustice. He was unjustly accused. He was tortured. He was oppressed. And he was put to death in your place. He died the death that we deserve to give you the mercy you need most. Friends, if you're exploring Christianity, there is no other religion in the world that claims God became poor so you could be rich and receive salvation, eternal life, amen? That's who Jesus is. And that's who Jesus calls you to serve at Christmas. He says, I identify with the poor. Do you? When you see the homeless person on the street, do you look beyond the rags in the ruin and see me looking back at you? I'll close with this. There's a sculpture in Ohio right now that's causing an uproar. The statue is called Homeless Jesus. It depicts Jesus huddled on a blanket, sleeping on a bench. You can see his head is covered, but his bare feet are sticking out. And you know it's Jesus. Do you see why? You see the wounds from his crucifixion. And this statue was put in the lawn of a local church. And it looks so realistic that someone driving by actually called the cops to report there's a vagrant, a homeless man, sleeping on the bench outside the church. We don't really expect to see Jesus huddled among the poor and oppressed, do we? And yet that's where Jesus said, you'll find me. In Matthew 25, Jesus said on the last day, there's going to be two groups of people. And he's going to say to one of them, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. I was naked. And what did you do? You, you clothed me. I was homeless. You took me in. I was in prison. You came to visit me. In other words, we had relationship. And then he says, the other group, you didn't feed me, clothe me, visit me, or have a relationship at all with me. And both groups are going to say, wait, 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 Lord, when did we see you in those situations? She says, I don't remember that. And the king will reply, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, my sisters, you were doing it to who? Me. Jesus doesn't just identify with the poor. He became poor so that you could be rich and full of grace and mercy and live a generous, beautiful life. Is that not beautiful? By the way, if there's somebody here who's rejected Christianity, you've walked away from the faith or you're deconstructing your faith. Did you know this was at the heart of it? That's why it's called good news. When your heart fully grasps the humility, the love, the compassion of Jesus, you can't help but change and become a person of generosity and justice. Amen? Guys, it's Christmas. Jesus, it's, 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 it's your birthday. What do you want for Christmas? I want you to, you know, do, everyone, justice. I want you to love mercy. And I want you to walk humbly with me, your God. Will you? I hope you will. Let's bow our heads and talk to Jesus together. Wow, Lord, I'm just struck. <laughs> Whew. You feel that? What a God you are. Jesus, we just announced there is no one like you. You are fully God and yet became fully man. And so we worship anew at Christmas. Thank you. Thank you for leaving heaven's throne. I wouldn't have done that. Thank you for emptying yourself and becoming poor. I wouldn't have done that. Thank you for being born in the straw and the squalor. We wouldn't have done that. 
And thank you for dying on a cross. We couldn't have done that. Jesus, we believe you became poor so that we might become rich. And I thank you for the gift of eternal life. If you're here today or you're online, you've never put your faith in Christ. That's simply what it means. You actually say, I believe. Not some sentimental schmaltzy, I believe in God, but I believe God became a man, was born of a virgin, died on a cross for me, and now wants to live through you. If that's you, you could just say, just pray with me. Just say, God, I'm poor. I'm a beggar. And I need you. I need a savior. Rescue me. Come into my heart. I want to be a person of love and generosity and beauty and grace. Forgive me of my sins and give me your righteousness. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and I will follow you to the ends of the earth. Give me a relationship with you and a relationship with the poor. And I'll serve you as I serve them. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray right now that you bless the rest of December. May this be one of our most joyful, generous Decembers we've ever had as a church. I pray for our partners at Rise Against Hunger, that those million meals would just bless the poor in the Philippines. God, as we go out of here, I ask you bless city relief and that every interaction in the city streets of Newark and Patterson, well, we ask that we'd meet you there, Jesus. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, everyone said together, amen. Thanks for watching the Liquid Church YouTube channel. Hey, don't stop here. I want to invite you to be part of our online community. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And share this with a friend. You know, everybody's welcome to join us. If you are blessed by this message, you can support our ministry by clicking the Give Now button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Christ. Thanks so much for watching. God bless.